Cascade Hoops Talk, bringing the world NAI basketball one podcast at a time. Cascade Hoops Talk. Hey, this is Billy D. Good morning. Hey, I know I always say I'm really excited and you're patient with me, but hey, I'm really excited about this show today. We have Adam Hepker. He's, uh, you guys all know who he is. He's a mid-American Nazarene. Uh, He's assistant there right now. Um, He's going to transition to the head coach there. Mid-American Nazarene is a wonderful program. Adam Hepker is a very nice guy. I really enjoyed talking to him. You know, Adam Hepker, he was a starting point guard at Mid-American Nazarene from 2004 to 2008. He won 115 games while he was in that program. They went to the national tournament four times out of his four years. They went to the final four three times, winning one national championship. He was a three-time All-American, two-time Conference Player of the Year, and in 2013, He was inducted into the Mid-American Nazarene Pioneer Hall of Fame in 2013. Congratulations, Adam, on that. That is a great accomplishment. We're going to talk about his statistics. Uh, You're going to notice that he really didn't want to talk about them much, but I'm going to tell you. He scored over 2,200 points and uh, over 820 assists. And I have researched this before uh, when I was following up on what Mitch Fink did at Oregon Tech. There is literally a handful of... And when you say a handful, it's literally a handful of college basketball players, not NC2A, D1, D2, NA, college basketball players. I think there's like 12 or 13 that have scored over 2,200 points and over 820 assists. It's the, the list is very, very short. I mean, you're talking about people like Gary Payton and Sherman Douglas. But out of this list, three of them went to Mid-American Nazarene. Isn't that amazing? And he was one of them. So he was an amazing point guard. You know, when he left, when he graduated, he uh, went overseas. He played for a little bit. And then he came back to Mid-American Nazarene and he helped assist there for about five years. And then he got an opportunity to go over to Grandview. He was there for a couple of years. And then he had a great opportunity to start the program out in Ottawa, Arizona. Everywhere Adam Hepker has gone, they've been successful. And he's going to do the same thing in Mid-American Nazarene. Also, I will, <laughs> we're going to start out with a little bit of a sore subject for him, but you got we're going to talk about that Oklahoma Wesleyan game the other night. If you haven't went and watched that game, just go find it. It's got to be somewhere and and watch the last 10 minutes. It was just it was simply amazing. It was an inspiring basketball game. The pride, the guts, the hustle that was on the court in those last 10 minutes by both teams. It's just that's the way college basketball is supposed to be played. And Oklahoma Wesleyan came out on top. I mean, it it there were sparks in the building, I swear. It was it was that electric. So anyway, you gotta find that game. So you're really gonna enjoy listening to uh, our interview with Adam Hepker. He's a great guy. And uh I'll stop talking now because you don't want to listen to me. And let's bring in Adam Hepker. He'll be in just one moment. Hey, this is Billy D, Cascade Hoops Talk. Hey, thrilled today we have Adam Adam Hepker. He's the assistant coach over at Mid America Nazarene. Welcome, Coach. Uh, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to uh, talk some hoops with you today. So you guys are three and two as we make uh, as we record this interview. A couple of road losses. I want to ask you about the Oklahoma Wesleyan game. You've lost obviously two dramatic games. They were both close, but that yeah. Oklahoma Wesleyan game that was something special. Everybody who. The last 10 minutes of that game, I, I've called it a couple of times inspiring, seeing yeah. the pride, the hustle, the, just, it was unbelievable that, that game on that court, that last 10 minutes. Yeah, it was, I mean, obviously on our end, it was, it was heartbreaking um, because our guys were so good to put us in a position to win on a really, really good team's floor in a very, you know, hostile environment. They don't lose at home very often. And for about 33, 34 minutes, we were really, really good. Our turnovers caught up with us. You just can't turn it over that many times against a team like Oklahoma Wesleyan. Yep. Um, but, you know, classic Coach Lamar, 
difficult non-con schedule here going to USAO and then turning around three days later and going to Oklahoma Wesleyan and, and, uh, our guys' response has been awesome. There's been no, like, what are we doing? Why are we playing these teams? They kind of savor it and, and then have embraced those games. And we keep going back and forth between, like, golly, we had chances to win them both versus, man, our guys are tough and, and they compete. And, and we were really, really poised in both games, um, which is huge because we're going to be in those environments the rest of the year in this good, good conference we're in. So, it was an awesome game, awesome atmosphere. Um, obviously, we didn't come out on the right end of it, but I think we learned a lot. We'll watch it today. We'll watch some clips on it, and, and we'll tell the truth and, and uh, see if we can't fix it. And we got another big one this week with, with Bethel at the end of the week. So, yeah. um, you know, hopefully we can learn from these. And we're a little bit battle-tested already. I like that a lot. We've already played five times. And, and uh, you know, our, as I said, our guys' response to these defeats has been encouraging because – there hasn't been any second guessing or any doubt because they have, I think they've seen, and we have shown them on film, like, Hey guys, look, look what you guys are capable of, uh, you know, that despite the outcome of the games, you know, coach, there was, you, you probably re- coaches remember every moment, but there was minute 10, something like that left. And there was a, the crowd had already come to come to life. The, the atmosphere yep. had already changed. And there was a play on the far sideline away from your bench and the ball had went out of bounds and, just watching the video, it looked like it was going to be you guys' ball. You obviously thought it was going to be Mid-America yeah. ball, and it went to yeah. Wesleyan. And, of course, you and Coach both were pleading the case. And then you could see in the video, Donnie's down on the other end. That happened, number one, the atmosphere is so electric. It, there's almost sparks in the room. And yeah. Donnie's on the yeah. other end pleading his case with his Bible in the air. And I, sc- <laughs> I screamed at the TV, sit down, Coach. You're not going to win this argument. You're not going to get that ball. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's, I've watched it a couple of times, obviously, and, and, uh, you know, whether we got pushed out or we couldn't get a timeout called or, or it was yet again, one of our, one of our turnovers in a really, really poor time. Um, but that's the way it goes on the road. Like you, your margin for error is small and, and stuff you can maybe get away with at home that you just can't on the road. I think our guys are learning that and, and, uh, I think we'll continue to learn that. And, and our point guard is a stud, Trey Brown, and he just, regardless of what happened on the sideline over there felt terrible about it and let us know that. And, and when you have guys doing that, like you've got a chance to grow number one, but you also have a chance to I- improve as a group because they're, they're taking ownership for it. And, and it was on his own coaches aren't having to ask for that ownership. So with a veteran point guard like that, like Trey is always going to give us a chance at the point. And the dude was just so broken hearted that he, he felt like it was on him a little bit. Obviously it wasn't lots of plays in that game. Yep. Make that game go either way. But obviously that was a big one. So coach, I want to talk more about your team because you have an amazing team, I think, but I, I yep. want to talk just a few minutes about your playing days. You and I were talking before uh, we started. I, I don't know if every, everybody knows you were a point guard. I think everybody knows that, but you were one of the most efficient point guards to ever play the game. You had uh Over 2,200 points, over 820 assists. I've told you before, I've done research on that, and there's literally a handful of people, literally a handful of people that have done that in men's basketball, in the history of men's basketball at any level. What was it about your game as a point guard? You started all four years. Yep. What what was it that you – I I don't know quite how to ask the question, but – what special skill, what do you think made you so good at that position as a double threat like that? That's a great question. First of all, what's really neat about Mid-American Nazarene and what Coach Lamar has done here is all of the All-American great point guards that he has produced, it made it really easy for me as a recruit to see what he did with point guards and the way he hands them the keys. I thought, like... You know, and kids get caught up in the wrong stuff in recruiting these days. And, and I could see, like, A, this guy develops point guards. He lets them go, and he, and he lets them make a lot of decisions. You know, it, it, it's, and it's going to happen organically and through concepts. It's not going to be driven through a bunch of sets. He's going to really let you play. And so I really saw that in the recruiting process. We had, for 16 years, we had four – Coach Lamar had four point guards that played the point. So Pete Carr, Aaron Harris, Matt Keeley, and then myself. For 16 years, Coach had four point guards that started all four years, which is just unbelievable. And all four of us communicated with each other. We still do to this day. The brotherhood of Mid-America is special. But then within that, 
the brotherhood of mid-america point guards it, it's almost unheard of how we pass the torch here from one guy to another and and so that allowed me to have success right away um our style at mid-america the the way we play in transition fit me perfectly. I love to share that thing and throw it ahead and, and take chances throwing ahead. Um, and then when I couldn't, Coach gave me the freedom and the ability to go touch the paint and, and go make a play, whether that was for myself or, or for somebody else. And so on a lot of those possessions throughout my career, we weren't running the darn thing except for sprint to the other end, let's go lay it in, and, and if we can't throw it ahead and lay it in, then he's asking me to go make a play. And, and so I think that was the result of that. But, you know, the way coach empowers us and, and creates belief, like he gives these guys, and this is something that I had got to take away from him. He does such a good job with it. The, the confidence, uh, the significance that he gives each player that plays for us, like our guys play with a different level of swagger and confidence because of our head coach. And, and he did that for me. And I see him continue to do it with, with our guys today. And, and, uh, you know, the stats are great. It, I, it's awesome to be in, in rare company like that. But in my four years, because of all the good players we had and the culture we have here, I won 115 games, uh, mm. you know, with my teammates. And that's the one that, that sticks out to me. That's how many guys can say in their college career they won 115 games in four years. And, and uh, you know, so it's special to be a part of that company. But all the winning we, we had and, and, and achieved is, is what, you know, my old teammates and I talk about the most. So you not only did you put up all those numbers, but you were three time All American, two time conference player of the year. You graduate school, your playing days are over. And yep. then you then you decide, first off, how did what made you decide to be a coach? Yeah, so I graduated in the spring of oh eight and the next fall I, I went to Germany. Uh, and played a year professionally in Germany in the in the first Riga and Liga over there. And so my junior year in 2007, coach took us on a trip to Italy, and we played three professional teams over there, actually oh, beat them all. Nice. Um, and somebody over there told coach, like, hey, there's a couple of your guys that when they graduate, they ought to consider playing over here. They're good enough that they should play. And then coach had mentioned that to me, and – and I think Danny Hawkins and, and uh, our, our stud big. And, and so that was kind of the first thing that, you know, kind of planted the seed for me. Like, hey, I could maybe do this after my after my college career. So I did that for a year and uh, wanted to stay over there. I, you know, I wasn't making a lot of money, but I, I was living the dream of, of playing professionally and, and uh, wanted to move up a level if I could to pro B and, and some contract stuff fell through. Well, I came home and played a half a season in the NBA or excuse me, the ABA with the uh, Kansas City Stars, okay. and then that league that league folded uh, at Christmas. They stopped paying us, and I was literally sitting around at home. Uh, I was getting ready to do my uh, my student teaching because I hadn't finished my student teaching. I was an education major, and Coach found out that I was back in town. I was back home from overseas and done playing, and he said, you want to come help me coach? Like, what are you doing? Like, get up to my practice, and, and, uh, and so that's kind of how it all started, and, and I worked for coach from 2010 to 2015 for five years. Uh, myself and Matt Keeley were his assistants. Uh, then I did two at, at Grandview with Coach Shaver, so in the same league as coach, which Iowa was home for me, so I was a little bit closer to home and, and got to be the lead assistant there. And then, of course, when Matt Keeley got the job out at Ottawa University of Arizona, he took me out there for, for four, and, and now here I am back at uh, my own mater, which I'm thrilled about being back here. So when you first started coaching, you we talked a moment ago, you had a special set of skills, and it's something that very few players who you coach are going to have the same set of skills. When you were young and coaching, was it frustrating for you that guys couldn't, if you watch them and you think if all you have to do is X, Y, or Z because you could do it, but yeah. they just didn't have that skill set? Was that frustrating for you, and how did you deal with it? Yeah, that it is initially coaching I love coaching there's nothing better than playing like this is this is how I you know feed my competitive juices and, and I can't imagine doing anything else but it is second to playing this game and when you become a coach when you get on the other side it is a it is a totally different view and I have to remind myself of that at times you know I'll still hop in some open gyms with guys at times which I love because you just get to see the game from a different angle when you're playing than you do as a coach but I think my my early years, I probably lacked the understanding of, like, how can I communicate some of the things I did as a player? Like, 
how can I get that across to my current point guard or, or my current players? I probably didn't go about that in the best way. And then as you do this longer, you figure out ways to, you know, put your imprint on the game. Uh, some of the things you did as a player, some of the things you, you learn now as a coach, um, I think that just comes with experience because when you when you turn the page, your, your first couple of years, especially right out of playing, I don't think we as coaches have a great feel or understanding as, as how to best communicate with our guys and, and kind of teach the, the same things we do. I think it just takes a lot of time to figure that out. You talked about it already. When you, when you left Mid-American Nazarene as an assistant, you went to Grandview, and then uh, you went to Ottawa of Arizona. Um, yep. I teased you before we started. I said you were never a knock around as a player, but you became one as a coach. <laughs> but you've seen, I think it's, I think my personal opinion is it's been probably been pretty valuable for you because you've been able to see different styles, different regions. And yep. now you come back to home, if you will. Yep. Yep. So w when you, when you went, made that round and then you had a, you were a, lead assistant at at Ottawa, assistant head coach. I'm not sure exactly what the title was, but you had a pretty yep. significant position there. So as you made these rounds, what are some of the lessons you took away from that that you didn't realize with Mid-America that now you can bring back? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great, great question because every stop I have made has been a learning experience. Um, you know what's cool, Billy, about each stop is, first of all, my first five years here as an assistant for Coach Lamar, he coach Lamar lets his assistants coach. I mean, this is not a stand on the sideline, hands in your pocket. Like you are involved. You have a voice. Not all assistants get to do that. The same was true. Then when I went to Grandview for coach Schaefer, coach was like, you know, this just speaks to coach Schaefer's humility at Grandview. He's like, Hep, I want you to make us better offensively. I know you guys played with pace at mid America. You know, I, I want you to give us a taste of that here and kind of just gave me the keys offensively. And, and, that was in my first year at Grandview, and, and and I just don't know how many head coaches, we as, as coaches are control freaks typically, mm -hmm. I just don't know how many head coaches are, are willing to do that. Uh, and we had a long relationship, both being Iowa guys, obviously, so that helped. But he let me coach a ton those two years, and we ended up making a national tournament my second year there, the, our second year as an NAI Division One program, which was huge. Um, and then – the same was true when I went out to Ottawa with, with Coach Keeley, uh, who's one of my best friends in the world, is he just let me coach. And, and, and so for at all of my stops, I have got to act like basically a head coach. I, I've gotten to have giant responsibility in recruiting and practice planning and, and, and coaching and practice and in games and uh, diagramming plays. And, and just, you know, I, I've just gotten to do everything, which personally and professionally for me has been huge because – I think a lot of assistants make different stops and they just don't get to be that involved. Um, you know, I think what I've learned, the, not everywhere, you know, we have as unbelievable facilities in America, great location in Olathe, Kansas. You know, we are scholarship well. Not everybody has that, so you have to learn different ways to win at different spots. That's been really good for me to see. Starting a program from scratch out there in Ottawa, like we started in 2017 when they launched that campus out there. It's a it's just a secondary campus of Ottawa University here in Kansas. They had no sports. There there were no teams. And so we Matt and I started a men's basketball team from scratch. And he got hired in April. I got hired in July and we signed sixteen players before we started school in August. And I mean, if you could walk and chew gum those first couple of years, like we would take <laughs> you. We we didn't care. It was about having enough bodies and to to have a practice and get a program started. We were practicing out of a high school, didn't have our own facility, carrying the balls in and every morning and doing laundry, and we had to be done. We started at 6 in the morning. We had to be off at 8 before PE class came in. And, wow. you know, all of, the, all of the hurdles that come with starting a program from scratch was an unbelievable learning experience for me personally um, and, and changed my perspective a little bit on just – what's needed to win and, and how you can win some different ways where, where you don't have all the resources that some schools have. So, uh, man, that was, there were days where Keely and I looked at each other, like, what were we thinking starting a program? This is insane. Like we're winning four games in a year and getting kicked by teams. And, and of course now he's got that program to where they're going to make some noise in the GSAC this year after, you know, after four or five years, it truly was a process, but there were some days it was very bleak and, and, but as you asked that question, I think like, man, I learned a ton. And, and as I get ready to take over a program here in the spring, like 
all of my stops and all of these experiences are going to hopefully allow me to be successful right away here at, at my alma mater. You were talking about going out and finding guys. You've been doing this, the coaching side, for about 11, 12 years, something like that. Has yep. your view of the guys we, quote unquote, the guys we need, the type of player you need, the what you're looking for, has that evolved or changed over that period of time? Yeah, it has. It, it has. Um, you know, I want character and I want skill, first and foremost. Um, you have to be able to shoot it. I'm really, really big on, on a kid being able to score. I am – I. When I first started, I probably got caught up in into what a kid looks like or athleticism and, and some of that stuff. And then and don't get me wrong, that stuff matters. You got to have mm -hmm. some of that in your program. But I, I want everybody on the floor to be able to shoot it and and be skilled to, to be able to shoot, dribble, and pass. And then I believe that I can teach you within our defensive scheme how to guard and and. But I'm not good enough to teach you how to score. I just I'm not. I don't know how to teach shooting. I, I don't. I can't teach a kid how to score, and, and I don't care how unbelievable he is defensively. And so, I want really really high character kids that are going to allow me to coach them hard, and that I want to spend eight to nine months with around the clock. You know, because the basketball season is a really really long year, and I, I want to be around kids that I like, uh, and that my kids and my family can be around, and and, and then I want those kids to be skilled, and and, and we'll figure the rest out. And so I. I think that it certainly has evolved. We call them our kind of guys or, mm -hmm. or OKGs, and, and they got to be high integrity. They have to be skilled, and we want them to be tough. We want them to love the game because we're going to ask a lot of their time. And, you know, when you're at a spot like Mid-America, you can get a little bit more picky on kids because we, we get to recruit some pretty high-level kids at, at this spot. So uh, that helps, and, and – um, you know, it hasn't made it easier finding the right kids because there's so many good schools in the Midwest and in this area. But once we find them, we recruit them really, really hard. And I believe that we end up with the right kids. I believe that, you know, you're not going to always have an unbelievable recruiting class year in and year out. But the right kids end up here and, and we're going to keep pursuing and, and recruiting the right kids and, and hopefully keep what, what Coach Lamar has done here, hopefully keep that rolling. Do you take them to Chipotle and see if they order a bowl? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I love it. I love it. That's I should. That should be stop number one on a recruiting trip. If they I order a bowl, course, they're off the list. That's right. That's right. Yeah, because you're constantly being evaluated. Everything you do, you're being evaluated by me. That includes getting a salad in a bowl at Chipotle. So. <laughs> well, you know, I think I I think that's a lesson. I talked to a lot of coaches. I've known a lot of coaches. That that seems to be a, a lesson that either people walk into it with or they learn throughout it is that the quality of the person becomes, I see as coaches become longer in their tenure, that becomes more and more and more important. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just because you get burned on it. I mean, it... You do. Yep. We got enough to worry about. When you're an NAIA coach, you do a lot of stuff. I mean, we're taking, we're helping with ac academics and we're helping with these guys emotionally and spiritually and, and you know, so little of what we do is is coaching the game and, we want kids that we can come in and challenge and help grow and they want to listen and they want to be told the truth. And, and if you take too many headaches to your point, it can burn you out really, really, really quick. Now there's some, certainly some, some pros to having some kids like that. And, and with all the transfers these days, like it's really hard to not uh, be attracted to some of those, but you got to have the right mix and you got to have a, enough of the OKGs to mm -hmm. who can kind of run your locker room and, and help uh, sustain that culture that you have. Because if it's, if it's the other way, if it's vice versa, you know, it's all of a sudden it's, it's, you're making compromises on things and, and you're miserable. You don't want to walk into practice every day. You're not excited about seeing your team. And, and uh, as I said, it's a long year, it's a long season that can wear you out real quick. We've talked a lot about coaching and head coaching it's official now, right? You're going to take over in the spring as head coach when uh, coach retires at the end end of the season. Yes, it is. It is official. I'm I'm happy to say that uh, our athletic director Todd Garrett announced that last week after our our second game of our Uphouse Classic after we beat Bellevue, and you know, I think a lot of people assumed obviously when when I when I made the move back and when that was announced, but they were just waiting for the the right time to make it official. But man, I I can't tell you how excited I am, how humbled I am to, to take over this unbelievable program in the spring. I played here for four years. I bleed Mid-American Nazarene. I mean, I poured everything into this program as a player. I will continue to do that as a coach. 
The program is in unbelievable hands because of what Coach Lamar has done. I obviously have giant shoes to fill. I'm fired up to have one more go round with him on his last year, and it's been really neat. Even at Oklahoma Wesleyan uh, on Friday night, Coach Boswick grabbed the mic and and had some really nice things to say about Coach, and and I kind of envisioned that happening at a lot of our stops this year. Yeah. So to be a part of that with Coach and and help him through that, it's obviously going to be an emotional year for him, and and uh, you know hopefully we can we can make it. A, we have the the talent in the locker room and the character to to make it a special ride for Coach. You know that's kind of our goal, but. To say I'm thrilled to be back here, Billy, is, is an understatement because this, as you said earlier in the podcast, like this is home. Like there's a lot of great spots, a lot, 250-odd NAIA programs. There aren't many like this one, uh, as you know, and then all the success coaches had, and, and uh, I'm excited to see if we can't continue that. So before we get to that point, there's a lot of basketball to be played in Olathe there in the heart of America. You're three and two. I think you're the best as we as we record this. You're three and two. I think you're the best three and two team in the country. One of the top teams <laughs> in the country. But uh, let's let's talk about this year's pioneers. You mentioned him a couple of times. You have a very good point guard out of Topeka, Trey Brown. Yep. He's five eleven, sixteen yep. point average. Talk about Trey. Trey is the is the point guard that every coach dreams of having. Having he's a yes or no sir guy. He allows us to coach him really really hard. You know, a credit to every single one of our guys. I got here in mid-September because of the timing of everything. I watched two open gyms on a Friday and a Saturday, and we started official practice the, the following Monday. And so I felt really behind and obviously knowing my guys and, and having a relationship with them here. And, and that's really hard as a coach because what allows you to coach a guy hard and, and build trust is, is that relationship. I just didn't have that, and, and I'm still working on that, obviously. But Trey and every single one of our guys has really bought into what I've been teaching and, and some of the new things I've been implementing. But, you know, Trey's an everyday guy. He literally is. That That uh, is a little bit cliche in the coaching world. But I don't ever have to worry about his energy and effort uh, in practice every single day. He makes us play fast. He throws it ahead. Uh, as good as anybody does in the country, he's willing to take some chances throwing that ball ahead uh, to Cam Brady and Anthony Brown, our guys that are running Darnell. And, and uh, you know, and the other thing about Trey is he hits really, really big shots. He is not afraid of the moment. And he, in fact, he wants that shot uh, in the moment. Um, he puts a lot of pressure on himself to to succeed and, and to be really, to be great for his guys. And, and so I wish I had Trey for, Oh, another year, two more years. I don't. Obviously, he graduates this year. We've got a giant need at the at the point guard spot, and as we've talked about, how big of a deal that is here at Mid America. We've got to find somebody that that can uh, you know rev the engine like Trey does for us. I want to ask you about that. Do you do you envision primarily uh, being a four year program? In other words, recruiting out of high school or build significantly on transfers? Yeah, good, good question. Um, I want a little bit of both. At the point guard spot, I would prefer a four-year kid or a three-year kid. You know, obviously our bigs, our size, a lot of times, I don't think that's unique to us at Mid-America, have to come via yep. the transfer because if you're 6'6 six, six and, and you can score one out of six times in high school, man, you're probably not going in AI because there's only so many 6'6 six, six dudes on the planet. So we'll sprinkle in some transfers because they're they're old and they're mature and they're ready to play, and, and I think being old matters in college basketball. And, and uh, But – at the point guard spot, at our at our wings, you know, we, we want as many four year kids as possible. We we have a really unique system with our play fast stuff that it's difficult to reteach that every year, and and it takes a long time to learn for our players. And so it, it's better we are better offensively when when we have four year kids. So, you know, maybe two thirds to one third. I don't know exactly what the breakdown is. We we understand that we're going to sign best available at the end of the day. So, yeah. you know, we don't really care exactly how it ends up. Let's let's go back to this year's team. You know, you talked about uh, Trey Brown. You have a couple other seniors uh, starting. You mentioned them already: Darnell uh, Miller and Cameron Brady. Cameron's from Salt Lake, but uh, yep. Darnell's there from Kansas City. Cameron yep. Brady, man, he can rebound, can't he? Oh my gosh, it, that dude is one of the best rebounders I've ever seen. My first go round here at Mid America, I coached a kid named Luke Thomas out of Raymore here, who was an unbelievable rebounder, and Cam is right there. I mean. In his area, out of his area, he's a quick jumper. He's really instinctual. Like, he knows where the ball's going off the rim uh, and knows where he needs to end up to grab it. And he's relentless. Like, 
he just goes all the time on the offensive glass. And the more you go, the more you get. And, you know, he runs the floor too. Like we talk to our bigs all the time about winning the race in transition. They have to win the race with the other bigs and cam wins it maybe as, as much as any big in the country from rim to rim. He is totally bought into that. So between what he gives us on the glass at only six, six, I mean, he's only six, six, obviously he very strong, very athletic. He, he's kind of a man among boys down there, but uh, it's his mentality more than anything. Uh, his, his motor never stops that allows him to rebound it so well. But to your point, what he does on the glass is like, we kind of take it for granted because he goes and gets them all, but it's unbelievable what he's done this early in the year here rebounding. And then uh, Darnell Miller, uh, he's he's out of Kansas City. He's a, he's a senior as well. He's averaging 11 yep. points so far. Yep, Darnell is very downhill guard for us who is capable of shooting it from three. He is he's maybe our quickest guard. I mean, his his ability to touch the paint is, is maybe as high as anybody on our team to just go by somebody. He's in the month and a half we've, we've been here. He has learned to get there and play off of two feet way better. And now that's opening up a whole new world for him of, of pivoting and scoring or pivoting and passing. And, and uh, he was as good as he has been on Saturday versus friends. Like his decision-making was on point. He was under control and I, I, he was leading for us verbally and I just thought he was – he just played such a solid, well-rounded game against friends on Saturday as we bounced back from that tough loss on Friday. So he's going to have a great year for us because physically he can do stuff that other guys can't with his athleticism and with his burst. And, and uh, he can dominate the ball defensively. Uh, and when I say that, I mean keep a guy in front by himself, which is really, really hard to do. So – you know, he keeps learning. He keeps getting his extra work in, and, and, and he stays healthy. Darnell's going to have an awesome year for us. A couple of juniors that you're starting, Anthony Brown, he's shooting 65% so far. He's he's kind <laughs> yeah. of your big offensive threat. He's scoring, he's scoring almost 20 points a game. And then you've also yep. been starting uh, Pedro Pedro Lopes. Yep, yep. Pedro's our other senior. Uh, he'll graduate for us. He's a, he's a five- or six-year guy for us with a redshirt year and a COVID year. Pedro is our quarterback defensively so vocal back there. Like he just sits in the paint and tells everybody what to do, which as other coaches will know, like that's a huge deal defensively. We hear his voice constantly. He's great in the ball screen, uh, ball screen defense wise. And, and he's pretty polished offensively as well. Um, I know he's a little frustrated with his start offensively this year, but um, he'll come around. We're not worried about that because of, of what he gives us defensively. So he'll be great for us as a senior, as, as kind of our starting five man. And, and then Anthony, you mentioned Anthony, like Anthony Brown is one of the best players in the country. He doesn't get talked about enough, but at, at six, five, six, six, shooting 63 from the floor and almost 40 from three. And the dude's almost rebounding it at seven per game right now. Like he's just taking it to another level. I had always kind of pegged him from afar when I was out at Ottawa as kind of just a sit and shoot guy. And when I got here, I quickly realized like this dude has it all. He can knock it down. He will go by you and get to the free throw line. He is really, really good defensively with his length and, and his intelligence. So he's one of the best players in the heart. He's one of the best players in the country. I'm fired up that I get him for two more years after this. Cause that's a great piece to start with going forward. Cause you head into that, Heart of America conference is going to be a battle. It's going to be a war. What are you – I know when I say concern, I know all coaches are going to list about 570 things, but <laughs> what are you excited about and what are two or three of your key concerns going into the season, the conference? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm excited to, to learn what the heart is like these days, obviously being out of it for, I guess, six years now, Billy. It, it's uh, I know how strong of a league it is because I played in it and then coached in it, but – I've been away from it for a while. So, um, you know, I kind of know the who's who of the heart because no matter what league you're in, you keep an eye on that stuff and standings and, and wins and losses. And, and uh, so, like, it's we play so many league games in the heart. It's, it's literally every night out. I, I believe anybody can beat anybody. Everybody's got to go through William Penn because of what they've done in the last handful of years. And they're obviously talented again. And Coach Moody at Benedictine has, I think, basically his whole group back. And so – they're really, really good again, and, and, and Park, I think, is basically in the same boat. Like, that's three schools right off the bat who can beat anybody in the country. And, and then you go down the list, and, like, Central Methodist is really talented. I just watched Mo Valley in, in uh, Oklahoma Wesleyan this weekend. They're really, really talented. And, and I think 
everybody should be better. Like with the COVID year, like you right. had a chance to to bring back your roster if you wanted, and then I think we all added a couple of pieces or tried to add a couple of pieces. I, I think college basketball as a whole should be better, and so it's not going to get any easier. I do think we have a special group here that that can beat anybody, but man, we got to stay dialed in and focused. And in the moment you don't like anybody in this league can, can beat you. And so I think as a coach, like concerns is just, is finding that consistency and, and teaching guys the approach that they have to have every single day, being present and staying poised at home or on the road that, that allows us to mentally be there for that possession. Cause I think if the talent's about even and, and the skill is about even like it's, it's the team that's present for mentally for the most possessions that's going to have a great chance to win. Cause we're not caught up about possessions that are over with or calls or missed shots. Like we're locked in. It's, it's a possession game. And, and mm-hmm. if we can be present for, for each of them, we're going to have a great shot to win. I think that's what we're really harping on and, and teaching and coaching and, and helping our guys understand. And I'm sure I'm not alone in that because just the depth of our league, you know, the, the second you take a night off, you're somebody's going to get you that, that maybe shouldn't. Uh, so it's, I I'm excited I'm excited to dive into league play. I think our non-con has has tested us and will continue to do so here. So it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm excited to see some old friends in the heart and, and see what kind of rosters they have. Well, I hope they treat you better than Donnie did when you went over there. <laughs> oh, no kidding, man. <laughs> you know, Coach Hapker, could you take a couple seconds and uh, or a couple of minutes and, you know, fans across the country, I'm always curious about the, the different conferences. Talk about the logistically, what kind of schedule you guys uh, play and talk a little bit about what the travel's like in the heart of America. Yeah, it's not bad. You know, like, I came from the GSAC, Billy, where we're chartering or flying to California every other week to play Thursday and Saturday, and, and I thought the travel was really, really tough in the GSAC just because of how spread out geographically geographically that league is. And, and you know, look, we've got some long bus rides here in the heart and a couple of overnight trips, and, and but the travel is it's, it's not that bad at all. Uh, what's tough is how good the teams are in this league. And, and you play, we've got a North and a South division. You play everybody in your division twice, and then you play everybody in the, in, in your opposing division one time. And it kind of alternates home and away each year. So, you know, both our North and our South are, are really, really, really strong. And, and as I said, I, I think anybody can beat anybody on, on any given night. So I think every coach believes they're in the strongest conference in the country. Um, I don't, you know, I think the heart's right there. I don't know if it is the strongest, but it's got to be right there year in and year out. So, you know, I'm not sure I'd want to be in any other league because of, of what our, our league does at the national tournament year in and year out and the representation we have. So uh, it's a great spot to be at. Uh, what nights do you guys play? We go Wednesday, Saturday. Oh, that's a nice break between uh, games. It's, awesome. it's, it's perfect. It's ideal. You get two days of prep for each game. Uh, you know, you obviously have the weekend there in between uh, in between the Saturday and the Wednesday game. So um, if you need to travel somewhere the day before, you can and, and you're not going on a Sunday or something like that. So, yeah, it's I, I think it's a great setup. And, and we just kind of once we get into December here, end of November, just start rattling them off Wednesday, Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday. Well, Coach Hepker, I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I've been trying to get you on. I've talked about I haven't tried. I've been talking about getting you on for a while. Finally, we were able to do it. Congratulations on uh, going, getting back to Mid American Nazarene. Going to become the head coach there. I yep. think that's great news. I think you're really the guy. I think everybody agrees you're the guy. But I uh, really appreciated having you on today. Yeah, thanks, Billy. Thanks for having me on too. I, I I thank you for what you do for for small college basketball and for the NAI and and you know you and and the NAI hoops report and just all of the acknowledgement and recognition that our level is getting like it's parents and, and players they really just don't know how strong our level is so anytime we have guys like you that relentlessly are putting stuff out about matchups and teams and players like that's special i think it's huge i love to see it i, I love all your your coverage so keep up the great work thanks for spending some time today and and uh look forward to a great year for everybody okay hopefully we can get you back on during the season and talk some heart of america basketball yeah, that'd be great. Let's make it happen. Absolutely. Okay, Adam. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All righty. See you later.